Thank you so much. Good morning. How is everyone today? Awesome. I, I am delighted to be here. I have um, followed the research of WCRI for quite some time, and you know everyone knows there's sort of research that's fake research, and then there's research that's real research, right? There's sort of there's sort of advocacy masquerading as research, and then there's actual real substantive contributions. And so WCRI has always been like the substantive contributions. I look forward to to seeing everything that comes out, I take it into account. It's, it's just really important, so I'm really, really valuable. It's very valuable, and I'm really glad that you do it and glad to be um, a part of it. Um, my job is, of course, in you know, roughly an hour or so to tell you everything that's going on in healthcare, which leaves us plenty of time at the end. Um, uh, actually, so it was, it was hard to quite know what, what what to talk about? So you know, so so we spoke amongst ourselves. I also asked my wife. I said, you know, I said, what 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 should I talk about? Like, I'm going to a group of people who know a lot about healthcare. What should I tell them about? And she said, well, if you're going to a distinguished group like that, um, you should be either witty or provocative. <laughs> and I encourage you to be provocative. <laughs> so uh, so I will try to be a little bit provocative. <laughs> Um, and along the way, there will be various audience participation parts, so try not to fall asleep. And uh, uh, I will explain the rules of the audience participation as, as we go along. Um, so let me t try and tell you a little bit about how a health economist sees what's going on in healthcare. I should say that the sort of healthcare environment at the moment is probably about as unstable as it's been for some time. So it's, it, you know, it's sort of thinking like, like, you know, normally you can say, well, you know, the thing is on autopilot and we'll maybe make some corrections, but, you know, basically you sort of know the direction that it'll go and so on. And here, um, I think at the moment, it w there's much more uncertainty than there has been for quite a long time. And so I want to explain some of that uncertainty to you and talk about how, um, how I see it. And I'll, I'll give you sort of how I see it and then how others see it, sort of, so you can g get kind of a benchmark about, about what's going on in the healthcare world. Um, I'm going to start off just with a couple of headlines. I mean, the, 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 uh, uh, there's no difficulty in picking healthcare headlines, ranging from the scary to the interesting to the just plain bizarre. Um, but, you know, there's sort of bankruptcies across the healthcare sector. And of course, we just came out from COVID, and there's still lingering effects. Uh, from that and from long COVID, which I hope we get to talk about, there's budgetary issues, there's workforce crisis issues, there's all sorts of things that are that are going on in um, uh, in in healthcare, and um, so the so so what I want so you know part of what I do is I try and kind of put them into different parts in my mind, like how do I sort of integrate them all, and I think that's probably the hardest thing, not like what do I think about any single one any one single issue, but how do I integrate them, and so I want to give you the two frameworks that I think about you know before diving into some of the specifics, but two frameworks that I think about in terms of of um, uh, uh, of organizing things. One is one you're going to be quite familiar with, which is supply and demand. So what are the factors going on in the supply side and what are the factors going on on the demand side? And I, I, I'll organize a lot of the, 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 my comments are around that. Um, and in, um, uh, and in uh, uh, at least in the current environment, I think the supply issues are far more difficult to get a grasp on than the demand issues. And so I'll spend more time talking about the supply issues than the, than the demand issues here. The second one is a little invention of mine. I call it trend and wiggle. Um, you know, so what's, what you see on the right is sort of a picture of, of real GDP. And you know, you can see there's a trend which is fairly smooth. And then there's like all those fluctuations around the trend. And those fluctuations are important. Those are real incomes. Those are real jobs and so on. But if you're thinking about the long term of the economy, they're just kind of wiggles. Right? And some wiggles are bigger than other wiggles and so on. And so one of the questions when you're in, um, I, I, you know, I, I, in any point in time is what is trend and what is wiggle? And is what you're seeing a trend or is what you're seeing a wiggle? And that can be very, very difficult to do because sometimes you sort of see something happening and you say, oh my God, this is sort of, this is going to be like a massive issue. And it turns out just to be a little wiggle in what was going on and the economy adjusts and then sometimes it really does turn out to be a big deal. So part of what I want to think about is kind of which of the things that we're seeing tend, are really trends, like they're really changing the trends, and then which of the things are sort of wiggles, like they're going to kind of matter a little, but fundamentally they're not, they're, they're, they're not going to influence the drivers of the economy. Okay, 
So let me start off. Before I tell you my views, though, I'm going to solicit your views. We're going to do it by a show of hands. Um, and so you're going to have to vote on one, on, on one of these. Um, and so I'll, I'll let you read them in a second. Uh, actually, I'll let you read them now. But as, as you're voting, I'm going to, uh, as you're looking at them, uh, I'm going to give you the rules of voting. OK, so there are two rules of voting. So please try to adhere to both rules. So the first rule of voting is that this is not Florida. So try to vote for the thing you intend to vote for. OK? Is anyone here from Florida? <laughs> and then the, uh, the second rule of voting is, is anyone from Chicago, by the way? Yeah, the second rule of voting is here we vote just once. <laughs> OK, so, 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 okay, so here we go. So, 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 so my, my, my official partner is going to help me tally the rough tally of the votes. So here we go. So the question, so what you vote for is, what do you think about healthcare a decade from now? Under reasonable projections, the US medical system will be cheaper and better than it is now. There will be some good and some bad, but the system as a whole will be basically about the same, or the brakes fail and we careen off the road, okay? All right, so how many vote for choice A? <laughs> you realize, of course, you do have to vote for something, right? Like, <laughs> It is election day, by the way, in Massachusetts, so like voting for something is good. Okay, how many vote for choice B? Oh my goodness gracious. How many vote for choice C? So I would say it was roughly 70-30 for B over C. So my projections are going to be different from yours. So I'm gonna put much more weight on A and much less weight on C than you do. Uh, so I'm going to take from B, and I'm going to take a little bit from C, and I'm going to give it to A. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that, but let me, but let me do it. Let me work my way there. And, and first, I'm going to work my way to the water. This, this is my primary form of health care. <laughs> I used to get juice, but that was too expensive on my insurance plan, so now I can no longer get the juice, so now I, I just go with the health care, with the, with the water part. Okay. So let's start off on the demand side with what's going on. So the single biggest thing was obviously COVID. What the interesting, uh, and, and so I don't need to talk too much about COVID, but one of the super interesting things about COVID is actually what happened to non-COVID medical care. Um, and the, the, the most striking thing for the healthcare economy is that non-COVID medical care basically fell off and it has not really recovered. It's recovered mostly, but not totally, and the care that was deferred never seemed to have showed up again. So what happens is COVID comes, we sort of shut things down, we say to people, you know, stay home and so on and so forth. And then like the immediate thing that we pick up, which is really bizarre, is that like fewer people are showing up with heart attacks in the hospital. And fewer people are showing up, I mean, some things you can understand, like fewer people in auto accidents because people aren't, aren't driving and stuff, but you know, you don't see people showing up with broken hips and you don't see people showing up with all sorts of stuff. And so there's this big drop, you know, you see a big drop in sort of healthcare visits and stuff like that, but it, particularly in the severity of healthcare visits. And then in the sort of electiveness of healthcare visits, like, you know, you sort of, obviously we postponed for a bit sort of elective knee replacements and elective hip replacements because of, of, of arthritis and stuff like that. But and then people were like, okay, fine, when will that stuff come back? And the answer was it never really came back. Like we never filled in the hole. Now, utilization sort of came back, like this chart shows you that, um, um, you know, admissions, hospital admissions mostly came back, although they're still somewhat down, a little bit down from where, um, uh, where trend would have suggested they would be. Um, and then the, the sort of lack of filling in. So why is that an issue? So number one, it's an issue because it helped to help the medical system not to have all these burdens in addition to COVID going on. But, but what, one thing that's particularly important is the stuff that disappeared is the stuff where providers make a lot of money. So COVID is not a very big money maker. Basically, you make money in the healthcare industry by doing procedures. So if you want to think about it, like the single most lucrative thing you can do just about is say do an elective knee replacement or an elective hip replacement or any kind of small, even smaller sort of discretionary elective thing where you can bill high and it's not that much work and stuff like that. And so what happened here was a big loss for healthcare providers. And so I actually think that the part of the COVID experience that's most resonant is that the provider community realized, like it used to be that healthcare was uh, just like it always, you know, it was always going to be there, rain or shine, you know, a boom or recession, healthcare was always going to be steady, and that healthcare turned out not to be steady. 
and the revenue projections are, you know, have a lot more variability going forward than they used to. That's really important because amongst many other things, that contributes to small providers saying, I can't make a go of this on my own. And so we're seeing a renewed wave of providers saying, I'd better run for safety. And how do I run for safety? I run for safety in a big group. So if I'm an independent hospital, I better be with a big group of doctors. And if I'm an independent or small group physician, we better merge with a bigger group of physicians. So I lost money, I, I lost directly, and I'm now looking at the prospect of you know, more of these sorts of things. COVID is unlikely to be a one-off. I've tried to ask like my immunologist friends what's the likelihood that we'll have another COVID or how frequently will we have another COVID. Um, and their answer seems to be about every 20 or 25 years or so we should expect an event roughly as bad as COVID, if not worse. In many ways, actually, we got lucky with COVID that it wasn't more fatal. Um, SARS and MERS, which preceded it, were actually much more fatal than COVID was, but they were, hard, they were harder to spread. So in many ways, we got lucky. So the sort of revenue projection looking forward, so there's both the immediate loss and then the projection of things going forward are, I think, a really big outcome of COVID that way, far more so than just the fact that people got sick and, 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 and that by itself was terrible. Another, by the way, out outstanding feature of COVID, which I'll come back to a little bit, is long COVID which is still with us and is still a very, very big deal for employers and for workers' compensation, pro a little bit less workers' compensation, but a lot more disability type programs and so on. So it's a, it's a super big deal. Um, so that's the first part um, uh, on the demand side. The, the second thing, which I was hoping was a trend, but uh, alas, is turning out to be uh, a little bit more of a wiggle than I had hoped for, is the use of telehealth. So there was sort of incredible demand, you know, if you looked at it, there was like a lot of demand among patients for being able to see doctors in ways outside of literally going to the doctor's office. It's kind of bizarre that when people are sick, we tell them to go out and to go mingle with other people and then to, you know, kind of get their medical care uh, taken care of that way. Um, and there are people just in general who have difficulty uh, traveling and so on. So of course what happened, telehealth went up an enormous amount and that was great and everyone was like, oh, this is fantastic. And I wrote like a couple of columns about how wonderful it was that like, you know, here was the silver lining to COVID. I like to find silver linings in things. It's more fun than the reverse. Um, so, you know, here was, here was the silver lining and we were all gonna get to go see the, the doc again and uh, get not have to go see the doc again and get to see the doc remotely and so on. And then mo most of the telehealth has sort of reverted back to in-person visits. So I would say probably about two thirds of the telehealth has reverted back to in-person visits. Um, and that's unfortunate, I think. So, you know, so this sort of classifies, I think, a little bit as a wiggle instead of a trend. That is, we're not, we haven't sort of embraced the model, which is we can now do a lot of things by telehealth, although, although again, I'll come back to areas where, where, where we've done more of that. The one major area of medical care that's really very different than it used to be is psychotherapy. So most psychologists, psychiatrists will now see a ton of patients um, through telehealth. And, that, and like, if you look, like telehealth has become the modal way in which people access psychotherapy. And that's very good because traveling is very difficult and these are often people with a lot of difficulty um, engaging with the medical system and things like that. So that's all wonderful. That seems to be the, the sort of single biggest area in which you see this huge residual of, um, uh, of, of people using, uh, using telehealth. I still think there's a lot more to be done in telemonitoring of of things and telehealth care of things, but COVID may not have been the instrument to do that. We're now, um, you know, in a situation where people talk a lot about, you know, what should be the pricing for telehealth going forward. The pricing hasn't really changed, although people are afraid that the pricing will come back. Um, but what should what should be our outlook with respect to uh, to to uh, uh, continuing with telehealth and so on? That's I think going to be a challenge. That is, if we want to do more telehealth, it's, there's going to have to be some e something beyond just um, just what happened during COVID to that. Okay, so those are the two things that I want to tell you about on the demand side. I want to pick, to pick up where I think are the, the, the most important issues. And so the first one is on the supply side. And so the first one is burnout. And this is absolutely a serious issue here. During COVID, a lot of healthcare workers burned out. Um, they were caring for many more patients than they usually were and so on. They were willing to do it because like in a crisis, you know, on a battlefield, you sort of do what you need to do to save the patients. And then when kind of the battle ends, people realized how exhausted they were. Many workers in healthcare also had 
um, COVID experiences in their family, and to come back to uh, an issue I mentioned very briefly, long COVID is an issue for a lot of people in healthcare because it's face-to-face, -face, and so the probability of getting COVID and then long COVID uh, symptoms is beyond that. Um, plus, when some people start to leave the labor force, that puts more burden on others. And so you sort of got this spiraling effect where a few people leave the labor force and then the workload for the others has to go up and then they get burned out and some of them leave and then the workforce goes up. So we have, for example, in the state of Massachusetts, you know, tens of thousands of unfilled medical positions like, like hospitals, doctor's offices, just begging for workers to come and they couldn't find workers. And we were like, you know, importing workers from Ohio and why were we importing them from Ohio? It wasn't that Ohio didn't need them, Ohio needed them, but we were willing to pay more than Ohio. And it turns out actually Ohio was willing to pay more than Kentucky, so they would move from Kentucky to Ohio, and then others would move from Ohio to Massachusetts, and then you know, they would go from Alabama to Kentucky. And you know, so you could, like, you know, whoever was willing to pay more would get the workers. That, but, you know, but the basic fact around, the, world, around the, the country was that there weren't enough healthcare workers, and there still probably are not enough healthcare workers, although it's coming back, um, to meet all the needs of the patients. And so that was a real um, big issue. Plus, I think part of it was people had their stimulus checks and they hadn't had a chance to spend them, so people had cash in the bank, and so they were thinking about career changes, and the healthcare workforce was older, and people had been thinking about retiring anyways, so it was a good time to go ahead and retire. This, is, this just became and has and remains a very, very big issue. In addition to the total reduction in the number of people, it's also where they're located. So for a long time, hospitals had difficulty bringing people, basically fully staffing up. The places where people were willing to come back to work were doctor's offices. This then blended into other things in hospitals. For example, um, uh, there was a lot of kind of, um, a lot of folklore, I can't tell how true it was, but a lot of folklore about patients who were mean to healthcare providers, about um, feeling unsafe in a healthcare facility, about patients who knew exactly what they could do and couldn't do and therefore walked up to the line in terms of doing things like that. Um, and so if you're sort of dealing with burnout and you're worried that the patients who are coming in are not COVID vaccinated and you're gonna get COVID again and then you're worried about workplace violence and so on, it becomes a very difficult thing to get folks back. So a lot of states started initiatives like South Carolina started like trying to advertise for people to come back to you know, to work in the healthcare industry and, you know, sort of compact, like, we'll train you and we'll do a bunch of things. You know, healthcare or, or has often been very bad at that. So hospitals had a long, long period. It wasn't until very recently that hospital employment actually came back to where it was. When the hospitals didn't have enough workers, what they would do is they would shut down parts of the hospital. And basically what they would shut down is the sort of least profitable parts because they needed the money, you know, they couldn't, you know, they were sort of short on money after COVID because of the patients who weren't there and the elective things that weren't there. So what is it that doesn't pay very well? Psychiatric care doesn't pay very well. Um, other long-term care for people with relatively poor insurance status. They wanted to keep all the elective surgeries they could because that was how you made money, although even then they sometimes couldn't find the nurses and stuff for them. But so this was a super big deal on the hospital end, somewhat less on the doctor end because that was a sort of easier kind of job, and really, really incredibly hard on, this, on the skilled nursing facility long-term care end. And in fact, that has not, that industry, which is in red here, has not made up its employment at all. That's actually a different set of workers. It tends to be um, uh, LPNs instead of RNs, that is licensed practical nurses. It tends to be home health aides and personal care aides. Very, very low paid, just absurdly low paid. So these are people for whom if they're not in healthcare, maybe they're in retail, maybe they're in the hospitality industry, working in hotels and so on. Everybody was looking for workers, right? Hotels were desperate for workers, restaurants were desperate for workers and so on. And so I think some of that industry actually just, some of the employees in that industry actually just left the industry. They just said, look, I, I got a better opportunity elsewhere. And they didn't have that much training, specific training left into healthcare. So that industry has not yet recovered. Hospitals are kind of on the road to recovery, like people are coming back into hospitals and we're not hiring as many nurses from Ohio as we used to and stuff like that. Um, doctor's offices are doing okay, but it's still virtually impossible to get like a very quick placement in a nursing facility in some parts of the country. So if a patient does show up with a broken hip and you try and send them to a nursing facility, often they're sitting in the hospital for a long period of time because they just literally cannot find a bed somewhere outside of the hospital to put them. The same would be true for psychiatric emergency care. The, the psych hospitals or the 
psych clinics just literally don't have enough workers to staff the beds that you would need to put people in. So that low paid workforce has been a really, really big issue. Basically the low paid workforce and the workforce that's kind of afraid to come back has been a really, really big issue. It's sort of settling down now, but it's unlikely to come back to where it was anytime soon. Most of the hospitals that I know of say like, if you're gonna put money in healthcare, where would you put money? Please make there be more post-acute beds where we can put people because we're desperate for that space where we can actually treat the people who we want to treat, the elective surgery folks, so on and so forth, make the money back, but we don't have anywhere we can put them. Um, so that's one part of it is, is, is there, the sort of, you know, the, they need the workers. Um, over the longer term, they probably don't need the workers. So over the longer term, the, the, the biggest trend, I think, in the hospital industry is that we still have too many hospitals. So it's ironic, in the short term, they can't staff themselves, and in the long term, there are too many. And why is that? Because there's just an enormous amount of stuff you can do out of the hospital. So it used to be that you know, everything had to happen within the building of a hospital, and then uh, quite a while ago, we figured out how to move imaging out of the hospital. And then we figured out how to move minor surgical procedures out of the hospital. So you could have your cataract surgery out of the hospital and you can have your endoscopy out of the hospital and you can have your colonoscopy out of the hospital. And now we're figuring out how to move relatively more technical surgery out of the hospital. You could have your knee replacement out of the hospital. You can have your hip replacement out of the hospital. You can have your various other kinds of surgical things out of the hospital. And the net effect is that the need for hospitals is down and it's likely to continue to be down. Um, so I still, I look at the healthcare world, we're down probably about 20% of ho hospitals from the peak and maybe 30 or 40% of hospital beds and we still have a long way to go. And so if you think about what it's going to be, it's going to be much more decentralized with surgical centers here and there. And those are much, much cheaper. You don't have to build all the specialized facilities and all the fancy plumbing and all the rest of it for all the, uh, you know, and all the ICUs for all that sort of stuff. So this was a slide from McKinsey showing you that, you know, there's still a bunch of things that will always happen, have to happen inpatient and then a bunch of things that happen outpatient and then like a lot of stuff in the middle, just a ton of stuff in the middle. So this is, um, I think, a very big deal in the, in the sense that we're going to have to close hospitals and stuff. It's actually, even for those that stay open, it's going to be a really big deal because the patients who are going to be left are A, the least profitable, and B, the super expensive ones. Okay? So if you look, it's going to be like either the least profitable, like people with psychiatric emergencies where you're not rushing to go build outpatient schizophrenia centers. Your people are building detox centers and things like that, but they're not building schizophrenia centers. And it's, or it's going to be people who are so sick that, you know, they're kind of like in multiple organ failure and so on, and they need, they need intensive care. The, the economics of the hospital industry have been built on the idea that you cross subsidize from patients who are well insured to patients who are, or patients who are relatively healthy to patients who are relatively sick. And the problem is that all those patients who are relatively healthy no longer need to be in the hospital. So this is going to put a lot of strain on hospitals. One of the things it means is that the hospital's prices, if they're going to survive, are going to have to go up because they're going to be caring for a lot of very, very sick people. So, and, and the true cost of the very, very sick is much higher than they're priced at now. So I expect a smaller, much more focused hospital industry that's also per unit much more expensive but is used much more sparingly. And in exchange, a lot more outpatient kinds of things, people you know, going to get what a quick surgical procedure over here and a quick image over there and a quick thing over there and stuff like that, the cost for which will be lower. There's absolutely no reason why you have to pay the colonoscopy center that's out in the suburbs the same amount that you pay the colonoscopy center downtown, other than that the downtown one like has a lot of bargaining power when it buys the one out in the, in the suburbs, it wants to charge a high price for them. But there's no reason to do that. We'll kind of figure, I think we'll have to figure that out. But, but, but I look for a lot of hospital bankruptcies actually, and a lot of hospitals going under either through merging with others because they're just not, uh, not, not, not staffed enough or because they're, um, uh, they're, um, uh, 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 they just can't make a go of it financially and so they're going to they're merge in and then effectively close or become something different over time. 
Um, so very, very big change. I would not be in the, in the, despite Stewart Healthcare here in Massachusetts, I would not be in the hospital business now. Where I would be is in the ambulatory surgery business and stuff, and there's another reason for that which I'll also tell you about. Um, but one more in between, which is uh, prior authorization. Um, the biggest trend in the insurance industry has been the widespread use of prior authorization. Um, it's hard to describe how big this has been. Let me just give you a, a couple of senses of the scale of this. So prior authorization is like, doctor says I want to do X for patient Y, insurer says, well, first I have to approve it. The typical insurer has perhaps 5,000 prior authorization codes. Roughly half of them are medical, roughly half of them are pharmaceutical. So they're dealing with a situation where it's like, you know, the vast bulk of what docs want to do, they want to run through something. The prior authorization process, what, what you can't see here, the thing you can't see unless your eyesight is far better than mine, is a prior authorization form for imaging. And the point is that literally you cannot see it. Like you cannot actually understand what's on this without like scanning it with a with a microscope or something like that. You know, it's like exactly why do you want to do this image and exactly what, it, you know, what clinical conditions does the patient have and, and so on and so forth. Why do they do this? Because they've run out of other ideas for limiting use. So if I were to show you the prior authorization for, you know, oncology, it would be, you know, like, it, what's interesting is the oncology, when you want to do an oncology med, a very expensive oncology med, literally there's a prior authorization form that looks exactly like the clinical trial criteria that the FDA used to approve it. So the FDA approved it for refractory cancer of the X in patients who have Y in whom they've tried Z and it doesn't work. And so like the prior authorization form is, does this patient have refractory cancer of the X and a test score of Y and you've tried Z and it hasn't worked, check all these boxes, provide documentation, and then we'll okay it. So the prior authorization has become one of the de facto ways of limiting utilization. It is extremely expensive. Doing a prior authorization in total costs the country about $35 billion a year. Probably saves more than that though because you're not doing a bunch of $200,000 chemotherapies and stuff like that. Doctors hate it, but it's, like been, it's become a key part of the cost containment kind of agenda, particularly on the insurer side. And as I'll tell you in a couple of minutes, cost growth has slowed immensely in part, not entirely, but in part because of these sorts of prior authorization restrictions coming in. So it's a, it, it, and there, these show no signs of letting up. There's a bunch of like legislative effort focused around them. And so we're likely to see getting rid of some prior auth for some like things where it's stupid. Like they're still doing prior authorization for monthly antihypertensives for people who are taking like 20 cent a day antihypertensives. We can get rid of all that stuff, but the sort of fundamental like big ticket stuff is probably not going away. What I hope we can do is to automate it so that it doesn't require people so that, because we currently involve people in that process, not, um, uh, n not just computers and the people are very expensive. Um, but it, but it, that's sort of one of like the key trends which looks like a trend rather than just a short-term wiggle. There will be some efforts to restrict it and so on, but probably not that many because the insurers probably correctly believe that it saves them a lot of money when they do that. So it's, um, it, it, I don't know how big that is in workers' compensation stuff. I would be sort of curious to hear about it. It is absolutely enormous everywhere else in medical care. Um, and it differs by plan, it differs by type of plan, like the PPO plan is different than the HMO plan. If you're Harvard University and you're a big employer, you can customize prior authorization on you know, your own specialized prior authorization, so we can have a different IVF prior authorization than MIT, which has a different IVF prior authorization than Tufts University and all sorts of stuff. So it can just be like a total nightmare on, on the provider end to deal with all of this. Um, a little bit more. Um, the thing that's most upsetting to me about healthcare is not that we'll move stuff out of the hospital or not that we're trying to restrict utilization and so on. If you do those right, those are all fine. The thing that's most upsetting to me is that um, a lot of investors are basically seeing healthcare as an ATM. Um, everyone knows that the pricing in healthcare is all screwed up. Some things get paid more than they cost, some things get paid less than they cost. If you are close to being a monopoly, you can raise prices. If you're far, if you're, you know, if you're, if it's a competitive market, prices fall. And so there's a bunch of folks that, there's a bunch of sort of, call it financial wizardry, that 
people that are that folks are engaging in to try and take advantage of that. So if you can look here, you know, the sort of two scariest words these days in healthcare are private equity. Um, and so if you ask what is going on here, so they're investing now increasingly less in like devices and new drugs and stuff, but in things like health services. So what does this involve? This involves like buying up hospitals. Um, and how do you extract money from hospitals? You sell the land and the building. So the hospital owns the land and the building. You sell the land and the building to a real estate investment trust. You take the money, you pocket the money. Now you have to pay, you're renting the building, so you give the rent to the hospital. If the hospital can pay the rent and make money, fine. If not, it just goes under. So it's a kind of, for the, for the private equity firm, it's like heads I win, tails you lose. Like, I'm gonna take the money out. If the hospital does, okay, great, I'll make more money. If not, I'm just gonna walk away from it. That's what's happened in Massachusetts. We have a, a nine hospital system that's basically bankrupt. A few years ago, they sold the land and the buildings for a lot of money. Um, they took the money out. They paid themselves a whole bunch of money. Um, the CEO has a bunch of stuff that's very expensive. Uh, and now they're going bankrupt. And that's what happened to this hospital in Pennsylvania. You can do it that way. There are other ways you can do it. You can buy up a bunch of dentists. And then when you've got a lot of the dentists, you raise prices because you've got a lot of the dental market. Or anesthesia is another example of that. There aren't that many anesthesiologists, so you buy up a bunch of anesthesiologists, and then you own essentially all the anesthesiologists. Then you go to the hospitals and say, by the way, the price for anesthesiologists has gone up. Or we're going to bill out of network too, and nobody can do anything about it because there are no other anesthesiologists around. So there's a lot of stuff that basically involves taking healthcare and sort of seeing it as the ATM model. And this has always gone on to some extent. Like, there were areas of healthcare that were always ATM-ish. Home healthcare was the classic example, where you know, you'd sort of invest in a home healthcare facility, and then you'd get the hospitals to refer every single patient to your home health facility. And then like, the doctors or whomever had an ownership stake in the home health, so you'd refer everyone who, you know, to, to home health and stuff like that. So there's a bunch of sleazy stuff. But it seems to have gone, it seems to have become like, even more on steroids recently the sort of idea that we're going to you know, just find pockets of money in healthcare, pull out those pockets of money. Now, private equity is not always bad. So some, of, some hospitals don't need to be open. So like of the nine that are, that are now in a huge fight with the, with, the, with the state of Massachusetts, a few of them literally should close. They're not, they're, they don't need to be open. We don't need the bed capacity. We've moved stuff out of the hospital. They literally just shouldn't exist. OK, so that's fine. Um, but then the other ones, um, we really do need some of them. And the private equity is, now, of course, not particularly thinking about where does the state need the money or where does an area need the money. Hahnemann Hospital, the one on the top left here, um, was a very, very important hospital for low-income patients. I think it was in Philadelphia. Um, but they didn't have enough money, and so they closed the thing. So, it's, so it's, it's, it, it, partly it's OK to get rid of facilities that don't need to be open. But partly it's, um, it's just like, you know, we're going to, we're going to find areas, and if an area is paid well, we're going to stay in it. And if an area is not paid well, we're going to get out of it. And the problem is that in healthcare, the payment doesn't always equal the value. And so if the payment doesn't equal the value, wherever it's higher, wherever the payment is higher than the value, you're going to get too much. And whenever the payment is lower than the value, you're going to get too little. And that's sort of what we're seeing. So this has a really big implication, I think, for the, um, uh, for the, for the, for, for the, if you will, the demographics of healthcare. And you know, if there's the scariest two words in healthcare are private equity, in some sense, this is the scariest chart that I can show you in healthcare. So this chart shows you what's happened to life expectancy by income um, in, in uh, by, excuse me, by education in the US. The, the, the grayish lines are other countries. And so you can see what's happening to life expectancy, but this at life expectancy at age 25. So it's sort of going up in most areas. And then you see two versions of the US. You see life expectancy in the US with a BA, for people who have a BA, and life expectancy in the US for people who do not have a BA. And those are, first, the levels are very different. That is, people without a BA live much less long than people with a BA. But second, like since 2010, there's been no increase in life expectancy for people without a BA. It used to be, we used to say like, okay, if you didn't have a high school degree, you were doing poorly in life and you could sort of see like bad health trends. And now it's sort of crept up that basically if you don't have, have, have a, a BA, a four-year BA degree, you basically are, are not doing uh, well in life. And so the gap between the US 
if you will, uh, not be a educated and the rest of the world is growing a lot. Obviously COVID, you can see that COVID there at the end, um, uh, it took a, a huge, huge whack out of both those with a BA, but particularly those without a BA. But this is not a story of COVID. This is really a story of like the trends over the past couple of decades have been really terrible for people whose um, uh, uh, outlook in life is not particularly uh, good. So between this and this, that's sort of the, the part of like the healthcare trend that worries me the most is people are doing poorly and the system is failing them and it's increasingly looking like it's failing them. Okay, so now I've made you depressed. <laughs> so now I'm gonna give you the rosy outlook. I told you my outlook was rosier, so now I'm gonna give you the rosy outlook and then I'm gonna um, end there before you conclude that um, I'm a total idiot. <laughs> so what is the rosy outlook? Rosy outlook number one is a lot of the excess costs in healthcare can be taken out. I've been doing work with some colleagues and friends at McKinsey. I went to my friends at McKinsey. I said, look, you guys like really know businesses. Can we figure out like how much money you could actually take out of healthcare admin? Like just by, don't, don't dream up new spaceships that land and like transport forms for free or whatever, but like actually take like what we know how to do in other industries and, and they do and like actually just do it. So a, a, like a classic example of this is, um, how many of you have ever tried to um, go on the website of your healthcare provider and do anything? <laughs> How many of you have successfully managed to do that? <laughs> yeah, it, nobody will, it, it, so you can't. So like the call center at your typical hospital is absurdly large, um, and that's because like you can't do anything without talking to a human being. Well, that's stupid. Um, by the way, a very common reason why people call hospitals is to figure out what address to put in their GPS. So, okay, so, so just do things like that. So just like make the website actually work so that you can like get rid of all of those people and stuff like, you know, and there are people with sticky notes. Like when you call and say, you know, you need an orthopedist. They're like, well, do you need a hip orthopedist or a knee orthopedist? Like, so like, you know, cause you know, they may be different sorts of folks and stuff like that, you know, so they, the, so they still work off like those 3M notes, like, you know, ask about hip versus knee and stuff like that and all, all that other good stuff. So how much could you take out? So their estimate is like, close to $300 billion a year, like $265 billion a year of potential savings. Some of that is just stuff like fixing the call center, and some of that is stuff like taking the people out of the prior authorization, right? So prior authorization is, you know, the, the doctor's office Xeroxes the records and faxes them over to the insurer who scans them in and looks at them and so on and so forth. My analogy of that is like Walmart occasionally has to reorder paper towels Right, like, you know, if you go to the Walmart and you buy a roll of paper towels, they have to reorder. And so someone at Walmart has to call the person in the paper towel company and sort of say, please send more paper towels. How many people are involved in that transaction? Like Walmart calling the paper towel company and saying, like, we need more paper towels in Watertown or Boston. How many people are involved in that? The answer is zero. And how do you get away with zero people? It's the Walmart computer talks to the paper towel company computer. And how many people are involved in that similar transaction in healthcare? An absurd number, right? So if you could literally just make, just bring Walmart in and just say like, you know, can you get rid of these people? Of course they would get rid of those people. Like there's no reason to have people there when computers can do it for just a few electrons, which tend to be pretty cheap these days anyways. Um, so that's the first part is sort of, we, there is a lot of money to be saved um, and we know how to do it. So that's sort of point one. Point two is I think we're getting better at figuring out how to incentivize the best care and how to incentivize not doing too much. So I told you about private equity and the ATM model of healthcare. The alternative to the ATM model is the bundled payment model. And so the idea here, and this is kind of what, what um, Medicare does and what Medicaid does in some areas and what a lot of commercial insurance does is it says, I'm not gonna pay more every time you do this test. And I'm not even so much going to negotiate the prices of the anesthesiologists and so on. Instead, I'm just going to set a target amount of spending for each patient, and I'm gonna attribute each patient to a group, like a health system, right? So, you know, in Boston, the Mass General Brigham Health System gets attributed a bunch of patients, and these are patients for whom you're providing your primary care, and you're providing specialty care, and all this sort of stuff, so you're providing all this care, and I'll keep track of how much money it is, and, and if the spending comes in over that amount, I'll, you know, like, so let's say the target's $6,000 a person, if the spending comes in over 6,000, I'll reimburse you some, but not all of it. And if the spending comes in below 6,000, I'm not gonna take away all that money. I'm gonna let you keep some of those savings. 
So I'm going to let you keep the savings, at least some of them, from being more efficient. Now, by the way, do you want to go beat up on your anesthesiologist or do you want to go beat up on your um, imaging folks to say, hey, why are you doing so much imaging? And also, I'll give you more money if your quality is high. So I'm going to have a bunch of quality metrics that I'm going to rate you on. So if your quality is high, I'm going to give you more. And if your quality is low, not only am I going to take away, but you're not going to get any savings from having saved money. So we're getting better at moving away from a system where Prices are out there for each thing, and you figure out which price is high, and you do that, and you figure out which price is low, and you don't do that. You know, like when you go to the dentist, and the x-ray is paid well, so they do the x-rays. Like every two minutes, they're x-raying your teeth and stuff like that. And so you move away from that and just say, look, I'm just going to give you an amount of money. You do what's right. And if you provide good care, you'll get more. And if you provide less good care, you'll get less. And this has actually been very important in terms of encouraging both direct savings, like, you know, okay, for these patients, I'm going to do less, but also, also an ethos in the healthcare system that it's no longer an era where you just do whatever the hell you want and you just get away with it. Between the prior authorization hassles and the financial issues, it's really become a changed environment in healthcare. And that's contribute to, contributed to what I think is the single major, most important trend in healthcare, which is that the growth of health spending has slowed immensely. So you all know that healthcare goes up as a share of GDP every, you know, every year it goes up as a share of GDP. Healthcare is no bigger as a share of GDP now than it was in 2007. So 15 years, even with the COVID bump, we spent a ton on COVID, then we took that money out. Even with the COVID bump, there's no, um, there's no increase in medical spending. This, is, um, uh, this chart here is showing you Medicare spending. Medicare spending is about $4 trillion below where it was forecast to be in 2010. And on an annual basis, it's about a trillion. You remember when we used to worry like the budget was going to hell and like we had to have like 17 commissions to figure out how to like penalize people and screw everything up and stuff like that? You remember all those debates? And we never did anything and the debates have gone away. And why is that? Because the budget came in much, much better than we thought, and this is the reason why the budget came in much better than we thought, is that the growth of Medicare spending has slowed to basically close to zero growth in real terms. And this was like never before in the history of you know, Medicare, which is now you know, 50 something years old. Why is that? We're better at controlling prices, Medicare controls prices, we're better at limiting utilization, the ethos to not do too much, also, actually, some medical care, it turns out, actually saves both lives and money. Those antihypertensives that, the, um, that the, many of the insurers are still doing prior auth for, they're actually b both good for people's health, and it turns out they prevent heart attacks and strokes and stuff, and so they um, keep people out of the hospital and save money as well. Because of this, we have a lot more leeway to do stuff. Otherwise, we would be in really desperate straits. And the thing to me is that it, I think we're actually getting better at this, which then frees up our ability to do all sorts of things. So that's why when I gave you the survey, I gave you this survey, I said I was going to be more optimistic than you. And here's my optimistic forecast, which is that we're, going to, we're getting technologically better, scientifically better at figuring out how not to do stuff we don't want to do and how not to pay for things we don't want to pay. But of course, there still is this undercurrent of like, why don't I just take healthcare for all it's worth and why don't I make all the money out of it? So I give some weight to that, but more weight, as I say, mostly because I like to be optimistic than pessimistic, but more weight to um, we figured out how to deal with healthcare and sort of we're on the road to doing much better in healthcare than we used to be. So that's my, in the end, somewhat optimistic take of a bunch of things going on. As I said, it's a very, very difficult environment overall. So it's hard to know, like, if I turn out to be wrong, I'm going to deny that I said it. I'm going to deny that I was here, um, let alone that, that I said it. And I will come up with some excuse for why I was, in fact, right the whole time, which is typically what you do in these sorts of circumstances. Uh, but I will, uh, but, but I, I will say it's, it's, it's a very uncertain outlook, but at least I'm somewhat optimistic about what can happen. So I want to stop here. I want to uh, thank you for your attention and uh, turn it over and let's have a, a bit of a conversation about it. <laughs>